trusting in the word of life given in baptism, we're gathered in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And as God's beloved daughters and sons, let us call to mind our need for reconciliation with God and one another. God of the nations, in baptism you anoint us to be your people in the world, yet we have not been faithful to you. We have not loved and accepted one another. We have not reached out to those who are poor, hungry, or lost. Forgive us and fill us with your light, that we may delight in your goodness and serve you with joy. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In Christ, the grace and mercy of God are revealed. In Christ, your sins are forgiven. Walk then as children of the light. Amen. Samuel's prophetic ministry. A reading from the first book of Samuel, the third chapter. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, 
and visions were not widespread. At the time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Excuse me. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went to lay down, and the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, your servant is listening. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Uh, we'll be reading Psalm 139 responsibly. Lord, you have searched me out. O Lord, you have known me. You know my sitting down and my right hand. You discern my thoughts the You trace my journeys and my resting places, and are acquainted with all my ways. You encompass me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so far that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am often amazing. Your works are wonderful and no problem. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes are full of my sins. All I have written in the my days were fashioned before they came to me. How deep I find your thoughts, O oh God! How great is the sum of them! If I would count them, it would be more than the number of hands. Count them all, and I would stand in the Thank you. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who had sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again, the next day John again was standing with two of his disciples. And he watched Jesus walk by. He exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, they said to him, What are you looking for? He said to them, They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's brother, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which is translated as anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated as Peter. 
This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. One day, a father told a friend that his son was now a freshman at Columbia University. The friend said, that's great. What, what is he studying? The father said, well, he started out studying biology to become a doctor. But now I guess he switched to studying aeronautics to become an astronaut. Is that right? His friend asked. Yes, the father replied. I just found out last week when I called up the university to see how my son was doing, and they told me he was taking up space. <laughs> As you may know, being someplace physically does not necessarily mean that your heart and mind are also there. I unfortunately often demonstrate this when I sit in front of the TV. You may see me sitting there, and I may be nodding my head and seeming to listen, but there's a good chance that I'm not really there, if you know what I mean. Likewise, our physical location does not determine who we are or what we do. That just because someone is outstanding in a field doesn't make them a knowledgeable farmer. That just because a person is in a kitchen doesn't make them a skilled chef. And just because someone is sitting in a church building doesn't make them a faithful Christian. Physical location is one thing. Actively living a life is another. In today's Gospel lesson, we hear about two disciples of John the Baptist, who out of curiosity began following behind Jesus to see where he was going. And when Jesus saw them following him, he turned and asked them, What are you looking for? They replied by asking Jesus where he was staying. That's a question about his location. They wanted his address so that they could know where to find him. Jesus simply replied, Come and see. And they responded by going with him to see where he was staying. But they ended up staying with him for the rest of the day. So do you understand what happened? The men asked Jesus for information. Where are you staying? Jesus could have just said, 20 Clark Boulevard. And that would have answered their question. And then they could have just walked away and left them standing there. But Jesus didn't say that. Instead of just giving them information, he invited them to walk with him a little ways. Come and see, he said. And as they walked with him, they became so fascinated by him that they ended up staying a while after they arrived. The two men had asked a question of wanting information about a location. But Jesus answered them with a response that involved meaning and purpose, that pointed them to a way of life to be lived, a life in which they walked with Jesus. Every once in a while, someone drops by the church office during the week and asks to see our church. And the honest but snarky answer that I'd like to give them is, I'm sorry, our church isn't here right now. But if you'd like, I could show you the building. Because to understand what our church is about, you first need to imagine our gathering for worship on Sundays, and all of you people singing and praying together. And then you need to imagine that all of you leaving here, going out into the world to serve God and your neighbor in your everyday lives. That is what the church is really all about. Because you see, the church is not a building in a certain location. Rather, the church is a people. People living a way of life together. People walking together with Jesus. The two disciples of John the Baptist in today's Gospel lesson were searching for something. 
And when they asked Jesus the location of where to find it, Jesus didn't give them information. Rather, he invited them to simply come and see. And I believe that this reply is a model for us in our own Christian witness. You see, when people ask you, where is God in the world? What do Lutherans believe? What does it mean to be a Christian? They probably think they're asking for information. But in most cases, I wonder if our best reply is just simply, come and see. Bring them to a worship service and make them feel welcome. Make sure they get a bulletin and help them if they look confused. And, and talk with them afterwards about what they've experienced. These are things we all can do to any new face we see on a Sunday. Because you see, our Christian witness is not about giving people information, but involves inviting them to walk a little way on the path of faith. It's not just telling people the location of the church building, but inviting them to experience what it's like to be a part of a community that, that gathers for worship and is then sent out into the world. It's not just about handing out brochures for them to read, but bringing people into a relationship with others who are already on that journey of faith and who are willing to walk with newcomers who join them along the way. Maybe this sounds like a little frightening idea, that you don't know if you're able and ready to start talking to others about your faith. Of course, we have no problem telling others about a good restaurant that we've been to, or a movie that we've liked, or a dentist or optometrist that we thought did a good job. But inviting and encouraging someone to come to church, or sharing or forwarding a worship video, you may think, not me. I can't do that. I, I'm too shy. Besides, religion is a private matter that shouldn't be shared with others. <clears throat> However, I believe that's a false understanding of Christianity. I mean, while it's always been a very personal matter, Christianity has never been a private matter. Because it involves a message of what God has done, not just for you, but for the whole world. Therefore, it can never just be a private matter. It's news that always was meant to be shared. And thankfully, in today's gospel lesson, we're given some helpful good news to encourage us and empower us. That while the two disciples of John were searching for something, it was actually Jesus who turned to them and who first spoke to them. And then later, as Andrew brought his brother Simon to Jesus, again, it was actually Jesus who spoke first. Is it people, people may always search for him, but it's always Jesus who finds them and speaks first. This is even conveyed in Andrew's announcement to his brother, I have found the Messiah. The Greek word translated here as found is heurisko, where we get our word eureka. And it involves an aspect of unexpected discovery or surprise that isn't quite translated well in our word to find, which seems to convey a sense of intentional searching. So in today's story, Andrew's finding the Messiah is more of a surprising eureka moment. According to the legend, the ancient ruler of Greece, Hero II, asked the great mathematician and thinker Archimedes to find a method for determining whether a crown was made of pure gold or mixed with silver. And for days, Archimedes ran tests and did experiments, but he couldn't find out a way to determine if something was pure gold or not. Then one day when Archimedes stepped into his bathtub, he noticed that the water rose as he sat down, and something clicked in his brain, 
causing him to jump out of his bathtub and run out of the house naked, shouting, Eureka, Eureka, I found it, I found it. Archimedes realized that the way to determine whether or not a crown was pure gold was to compare its weight to its volume. If he had one pound of gold and one pound of silver and then submerged them in water, the silver would make the water rise higher than the gold because it was less dense and took up more space than the gold. Or if the two crowns of the same, had the same volume, that is, each made the water rise the same amount, the pure gold crown would weigh more than the one mixed with silver. However, Archimedes didn't find this truth by searching after it, even though he spent days thinking about a solution to this problem. Rather, his find came as an unexpected surprise. It's almost as if the truth found him more than he finding the truth. It was something that was there all along. He may have noticed the rising water in the bathtub hundreds of times before, but its significance didn't click in his brain until that eureka moment. Likewise, the disciples find the Messiah was not through their own personal searching and searching, but the unexpected and unanticipated surprise of the Spirit of God breaking into their minds and into their lives. And that same Spirit of God breaks into our lives today as we gather here for worship. You see, it doesn't matter how long you've been searching for something. It's God who finds you and speaks to you first. As readings from an old, old book somehow speak new and fresh words to us today. As a dry little wafer somehow makes us feel God's presence with us and in us. As an odd collection of individuals from a variety of different ages and backgrounds that somehow united and shaped into a community, a community that celebrates together, mourns together, and has a mission together. And this is being offered to you today as the Spirit of God moves and works among us. So may you be blessed with a Eureka moment so that something in you clicks, allowing you to see that this has been here all the time and that Jesus has been walking with you all along. And then, encouraged and empowered by this discovery, may you go out and invite others to come and see. Amen.
beloved children, let us pray that the light of Christ shines on the nations, the church, and all those in need. With a series of petitions, each ending with the words, God of light and life, and all responding with, hear us, we pray. Let us pray. We pray for the church throughout the world and for all called to follow Jesus. That the Holy Spirit invite us and others to come and see God of light and life. We pray for the nations and all in authority, for advocates and social workers, and for our armed forces and those who serve and protect our community, that all people may thrive together in harmony and peaceful order. God of light and life. We pray for all who are oppressed, for those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit, for caregivers and families, for those who grieve and cannot sleep, that comfort will come in those in any distress. Along with those listed on our prayer list, we may bring before you your concern for all those whom we name now and silently in our hearts. God of light and life, we pray for the youth of our congregation, that they might be exemplary models to their peers and glorify God in all they do. God of light and life. We pray in thanksgiving for those who follow Christ and now rest from their labors, that their witness provide a model of commitment and compassion until that day when we dwell with them in peace in your beloved community. God of light and life. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, both spoken and silent. For the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. 